So I'm very proud this morning to introduce you to uh, the chair of the Broadband Institute, le président de l'Institut Broadband, Ed Broadband. Thank you very much, Rick. I am tempted to say, in fact, I, I will say that was a very fulsome, uh, pleasing, uh, ego-satisfying introduction. And I know it's a sheer coincidence that his pay is dependent on my recommendation. <laughs> right. it, it is a pleasure to welcome you all here this morning. I did so last night at a bit of a soiree where we had the odd glass of wine, some more odd than others, uh, a very enjoyable encounter on a social basis uh, for people who have come from all parts of our uh, wonderful country. Today I'm welcoming you to the policy component uh, of the Progress Summit, and I do so with a great deal of pleasure. What uh, an incredible period lies ahead for us. We have an impressive agenda, impressive international speakers, an impressive list of 60 panelists, and I can say candidly, half of them I didn't know until I checked out their CVs by, provided by a remarkable young Jonathan Sass, a staff guy who did most of the work on this. Uh, a great uh, set of panelists with very high credentials indeed. Over 600 participants from every part of the country for invigorating discussions. I think this is pretty good. Or as reflecting my generation, as Jack Nicholson might have said, almost as good as it gets. Comme vous le savez, l'Institut a été fondé pour aider à bâtir le mouvement social démocrate et progressiste. Nous sommes un organisme indépendant et non partisan. J'aime bien souligner que, oui, nous faisons la politique, mais du point de vue des enjeux. Pour nous, l'horizon est plus loin que celui des partis politiques et le cycle électoral. Nous existons afin de bâtir une infrastructure on écosystème d'idées que nous espérons sera précieux au progressiste canadien à long terme. We seek to put flesh, if I can put it this way, on, those, on the bones of those progressive values held by most Canadians. Values that were verified in two empirical surveys done for our institute by Enveronics in 2012 and 2013. Since I won't come back to this point, I want to emphasize this. We conducted through a credible, independent and polling institution two surveys of the people of Canada, and I want to say back to back in two different years, contrary to what many conservatives in this country like to propagandize about, the large majority of Canadians and all their values are social democratic. You reflect the people of Canada. We champion as an institution the best ideas to move our country forward. And in that context, I want to say I'm very proud of the growing network of Broadbent Fellows whose innovative thinking you can now regularly read on our website, and many of whom are going to be participating here in our discussions. And as an institute, we respond to the issues of the day through press progress, which is rapidly becoming a major source of real-time news and analysis. Je veux ajouter que l'Institut Broadbent s'engage aussi à former des militants des jeunes leaders en particulier, 
afin d'approfondir leur engagement démocratique. Juste hier, nous avons tenu une session intensive. To come back uh, to the weekend summit of policy ideas, I want to say that this is something as an institute that we've wanted to achieve since our inception three years ago. Convening a gathering of Canada's most impressive thinkers and progressive leaders is a role we cherish. I don't think I've ever seen assemble in one place such a diverse and imaginative group. We have Francophone and Anglophone and Allophone, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal, men and women, and at least I will add one 12-year-old who is beginning her political mission by coming here this weekend. <laughs> we have a huge range of ages, which is critical for any vibrant movement to succeed. We have a variety of interests, environmentalists, trade unionists, gay rights activists, academics, social justice advocates, private sector economists, and many others who wouldn't pigeonhole themselves in any particular way. No matter who we are or where we come from, we are all dedicated to making Canada a better place. The topic at hand is, and I quote, paths to a new Canadian prosperity and to do so from a progressive point of view. What characterizes this progressive worldview, I would say, today? What is the best way to further this prosperity here in Canada? I would suggest that there are three beliefs that the people, excuse me, in this room hold in common. First, prosperity needs to be broadly shared. In this regard, how Canadians view the economy as an issue has changed fundamentally in recent years. They used to believe, certainly in all my formative years as a university student and beyond that, uh, as a teacher at university and even in my early years as a politician, we in Canada used to believe that as the, the economy got better, everyone, all ordinary people and their families, they too got better off as a result. The cliche of the time was that a rising tide lifts all boats. Canadians now understand that it is not the case and that ill-considered policies like income splitting, for example, will only exacerbate an already highly unequal situation, I add. There is now clearly a disconnect in people's minds between the economy issue writ large and their well-being. For every dollar increase in national earning over the past 20 years, more than 30 cents have gone to the top 1%, while 70 cents have had to be shared by the remaining 99%. And when it comes to jobs, research by Broadbent fellow Angela McEwen shows that one in seven Canadians and an even higher proportion of young people are either unemployed or underemployed, meaning that they cannot find as many hours of work as they would really like to, even though they're accounted as being employed in the employment statistics. Furthermore, job creation has been very much polarized between the kind of good middle-class jobs that Canadians used to take for granted and the much more insecure and low-paid, precarious work that has become so prevalent throughout the country. It should be then no surprise that in a recent Broadbent Institute poll, fully half of baby booners told us they think their children's economic opportunities are worse today than when they were growing up. I add in this context, I recently told the students of my seminar at Ottawa U that when I graduated, my debt burden was all of about 250 years after four years at university. And for every one of us who was graduating at that time, there were five jobs available. Five jobs available for all of us graduating then. Now we have, for the same graduates, five graduates sort of looking for every job that's available. That's the change. 
One of the key policy cha challenges of our time is, therefore, how to build the kind of economy that supports good jobs. Jobs that would be highly productive, highly skilled, and well paid. And, I add <coughs> with emphasis, to ensure good pay and more equality, as evidence has shown in virtually every country where it's been studied, we must strengthen, not weaken, the trade union movement. If we want more equality, we need strong unions. Building broadly shared prosperity in an era of powerful transnational corporations also means enhancing democratic governance of the market. Whether through stronger regulation in the public interest or through building a more diverse economy with a role for community and cooperative ownership and not-for-profit enterprise in the social economy. Or using the state in a more creative way as we shall be hearing very shortly uh, from Maria, who will, Mariana rather, who will be speaking just after I do today. Second, prosperity needs to be greener than it has been before. One of the fundamental divides between the conservative government and progressives is their approach to the green economy. Progressives, indeed most Canadians, understand then environmental and economic priorities need to be reconciled and made mutually reinforcing. At some basic level, it's just this approach that the federal government has rejected ever since Mr. Harper came to power eight years ago. We have witnessed, for example, on the pipeline debate, how self-defeating this conservative approach is. It's the federal government's intransigence on environmental protection that has fueled the corrosive and divisive rational debate, national debate rather, on pipeline expansion and not the alleged radicalism of the environmental movement. Not just progressives, I note, but also Preston Manning at the recent conference criticized the conservative government for its serious lack of a serious environmental policy. While we have witnessed on the pipeline issue how self-defeating the conservative approach is, it is the federal government's intransigence on, on the environment itself, I repeat, that has made the debate about this issue so corrosive. Successive Canadian governments, not just the conservative government, but successive governments have taken the narrow view that our economy can somehow be separated from the environment. They have set aside pressing ecological concerns like pollution and focused instead simply on growth. Dis dismantling laws and regulations designed to protect the environment, environmental assets that sustain our communities. We must stop making policy as though economic imperatives and environmental sustainability are at odds with each other. We have to focus instead on achieving international standards of innovation and environmental performance. We have to green our industries and create good jobs with globally competitive companies that can fuel Canada's long-term economic growth. I want to be frank about this. I don't say this is not a challenge. It is a challenge. It's a challenge for ourselves. It's a challenge for all industrial countries in Western Europe, it's a challenge for the United States, but it is a challenge, I say as a Canadian, that must be met, and it's a challenge that we can win if we undertake it. Third, this growing, broadly shared, and greener prosperity needs to occur within a context of a renewed democracy here at home. We need governments that tackle the important challenges of the day, armed with the best evidence and harvesting the best ideas from all stakeholders in the public debate. Certainly from public servants who are knowledgeable and need to be paid attention to, but also from civil society, from NGOs, from academics, 
and from charities. Instead, what we have is a federal government increasingly bunkered down, seeing enemies around every corner, routinely ignoring advice from its own scientists, categorizing important civil society groups like environmentalists and trade unionists as enemies to be subdued rather than intelligent voices to be listened to. Torquing, uh, excuse me, using closure regularly to subvert parliamentary debate, and most recently, torquing the electoral system itself for their partisan advantage. The misnamed Fair Elections Act is nothing more than U.S. Republican-style voter repression. You know, Rick mentioned that I spent more, more than two decades of my life in the House of Commons. And I can tell you, too, during the two decades that I was there, under prime ministers like Mr. Trudeau, Mr. Mulroney, and Mr. Clark, there has never been a prime minister before in Canada that unilaterally made serious electoral changes. They were always done after consultation and consensus and agreement amongst all political parties. The change has come with Mr. Harper, who has unilaterally imposed undemocratic changes on the people of Canada and our parliamentary institutions. As, as we can see in the Fair Elections Act, the, the activity is both unilateral and undemocratic. When I, when I worked to get beyond Parliament itself, when I worked after leaving Parliament as President of Rights and Democracy in developing countries, I normally pointed with pride to the democratic political institutions of Canada. And without exception, that perception of, Can that perception of Canada was widely shared. But I ask you to think of the highly ironic situation as we as a nation are confronted with, with Mr. Maroney and, and this so-called Fair Elections Act. The very time recently that he was off in Ukraine and promoting democracy, 19 serious scholars from a half a dozen countries around the world publicly denounced him for repressing democracy here at home. I say to the Prime Minister, if he wants to preach democracy abroad, which he should, he should practice it here at home. Whereas 10 years ago, progressives had little or no need to defend our basic democratic values and institutions, today it is regrettably essential. We must defend a strengthened and robust Elections Canada. We must also demonstrate to Canadians that unlike the present government, we in this room and thousands like us across the country want evidence-based policy. We welcome debate and understand the best decisions are made after vigorous discussion, very often by people who hold contrary views. So to conclude, for me, this weekend will be a success if two things occur. If, over coffee breaks, lunches, and social events, like last night and this evening that's coming, you emerge with new contacts and friendships, that will be a good sign. We live in a big country, and a mark of success for this gathering. We live in a big country, and we don't get together like this, well, I think, ever before, with such a diverse a group from uh, all progressive people, many people clearly defining themselves as social democrats, everyone here defining themselves as a progressive man and woman. I do not recall, frankly, in all my years in public life, such diversity of progressive people that's represented in this room, and I think it's terrific. And I want to welcome you again at the end of my comment. So I. It'll be a success if you do the kind of networking that is necessary in such a big country. But I also want to say 
that success will be merit measured by something else. And that is that we better leave here with some initiatives and policy pros proposals to present to our politicians, whether at the federal, provincial, or municipal level, that can help make our country more progressive, more equal, more fair for all. I assure you that what you come up with during these debates and discussions will be the grist for the Broadbent Institute's mill for many months to come. Thank you for your attention. Enjoy the weekend. À la prochaine.